Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Self-Publishing Podcast. Um, today, we're going to, after, a, if you were here live for the false start last time we tried this, we're going to try this again. Um, we're going to have um, Kelly Lytle from Find Away, Find Away Voices on. It, you can think of Find Away Voices as sort of a, an alternative to ACX is the way that we're looking at it. There's a little bit more specific there to it, but a different way to do audiobooks that we really loved when we talked to them in private. Do we have a, a contingency plan? In case we have an, uh, because our third time with this podcast, right? Right. The first time we we can bust his balls when he comes on, but the first time um, Kevin Tumlinson and Kelly were on, and they both thought it was a podcast, and it was never a podcast. It was at a <laughs> really weird time. We never said a thing. We never did an intro. We were podcast was never mentioned. We were just chatting, <laughs> and then Kevin's like, "Awesome! When's the podcast coming out?" Like, I don't know. You should record one first. <laughs> So anyway, but that, that's, that's cool. And um, Kelly's going to be on shortly. And in the meantime, round of uh, something cools. Um, Dave, something cool is that he's not still sleeping. That's going to be my guess. Is that your something cool, that's Dave? That's not cool. It's more cool if you're sleeping. Yes, it would be. Um, my something cool is actually a TV show that is on Amazon called Fortitude. Um, I would not heard of it before. Um, is it a pilot or a full season? Full, it's two seasons. It's been out a oh, couple wow. of years. Uh, I believe it was a partially a BBC production. And it takes place in the Arctic Circle uh, in this town, I believe fictional town called Fortitude. Um, and it begins sort of like a murder mystery like kind of like it's got a vibe of the killing some weirdness of small town characters uh you don't know who's up to what i mean it's got it ticks all the boxes that sounds it, like a dave recipe for sure it does but then it gets even more dave and it dead, it's, dead babies <laughs> uh no that's beginning of season two actually uh, <laughs> <laughs> um and i've only seen like 10 minutes of that um but the first season, it starts off one way and ends up a completely different. Like, I don't know if this was genius or if they just had so many ideas to run with. I, I'm not sure. And I'm not sure how I felt about the end of season one. But up until that, I loved every and it's like the most beautifully shot show I think I've ever seen. It's just uh, visually. It's just astonishing. The camera work is perfect. The scenery is beautiful. Uh, my God, it, it's if if so many horrible things were happening in this town, it'd be like a tourist commercial, <laughs> a tourism commercial. But it is a tourism commercial for you. For Dave. Yes, right. yes. I'm booking my flights right away. <laughs> well, not my flights, my, my train. <laughs> Do you know that that show, Stranger Things, was just based on Dave's bathroom? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that's coming back soon. I can't wait for that. Have you seen the trailer for season two yet? Uh, yes. Love it. Can't wait. Interesting thing about season two, or, or no, seasons three and four, I believe, or two and three, I'm not sure. But I think Netflix wanted the, uh, the creators of the show to film them back to back so the kids would, quote, stay cute and they wouldn't grow up too quickly. And the writers... A lot of Olympic uh, gymnast trainers think. Right. And the writers actually said, no, we're not doing that. Uh, we're going to tell the story the way we want. We're going to give it time to breathe and do it right. We're not rushing it out. So bravo to them. Of course, they do have a little bit of power given that, you know, it's fucking Stranger Things and like the most <laughs> talked about show pretty much. <laughs> Did you watch uh, the Emmys, Dave? Uh, yes. I didn't. I missed them. I was sad. My something cool, um, I actually wanted to do this one two weeks ago, or was it one? Maybe it was like two, one and a half weeks ago. It was basically after our last show. We didn't have one last week, um, but um, it's been cool for so long for me that it's now, it's a fever pitch of cool. <laughs> if that's a, well, if a fever thing. pitch of cool. Yeah. And it's- Not the blue balls of cool. It's a little bit of, it, it feels a little bit like a ball buster because it's, in a, in a weird way, it's old news now. I'll just, you'll see why in a minute. Um, but it was brand new at the time. And I had, I started writing in Story Shop Writer. So basically, um, I said, well, I, I can only play around in it because it was on a, on a temporary server at the time and nothing you put there would be permanent. And so I said, well, I can just go in and plink around. And 
Then eventually Jen was like, you, so you aren't working in there? I'm like, well, no, it's going to be gone. And she said, well, you can copy it out. So I said, okay. And when I started working in it, I was just so glad because the experience of, oh, this is what it's like. Um, the reason I said it's old news now, though, is because we did officially, um, we opened it early to the people who are already in there. So like as a gift to the early supporters of Story Shop to let them in. Um, but at the time it was like, ooh, where there's only a few of us in here and being able to, um, like, since we're the creators, every time I would go in, I'd say, well, this isn't quite right. And then I'd send it over to Jen and she'd change the page width a little bit or make the smart quotes work differently or something. And it's been like this, we're building it for ourselves and for all of you at the same time, building this awesome tool, which is just at MVP and is only going to get better. So that's my something cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll add on to Johnny something cool before I get to my own, which is um, I got to take uh, writer out because writer, writer went to all the previous users this week, like Johnny said. But before that, we were using it internally for you know a few weeks and testing it, like Johnny said. And I, so I had the staging site with all of our stuff on it. And I was, um, I was just around a, a group of really, really amazing people who have done some amazing things over this last weekend. And it was my first time in a live setting where I got to kind of demo Story Shop and kind of show it off. And the the overwhelming just wow reception that that the that story shop got was just so validating and it was so gratifying and i was just so excited we had a we had a story shop meeting on my first day back on monday and just sharing some of those stories with the team was a lot of fun because we've worked really hard and really long on story shop and it's finally out there in the world so uh yeah uh, my something cool is um just a silly show that's on netflix that um i'm I'm enjoying um, watching with Cindy called Disjointed. And it's, uh, it's, have you seen this, Dave? No, I thought you were going to talk about that other one with the, the, oh shit. I forget the name of it already. The one I talked about a couple of weeks ago where the, the spray painting of the penises that's out oh. now and I haven't had a chance. Oh, I to saw that. And it was like <laughs> the tagline is something like, you know, disorder, vandalism, dicks or something like that. Is yeah, that it might be vandalism. I think I don't remember, but, I can't wait to see it. <laughs> no, no, no. It's not that. It's Disjointed, which is a, it, it has Kathy Bates as the star. And it's just kind of interesting because it's a full on sitcom, like old school, like 20 laugh track sitcom with a laugh track. Oh. Yeah. It's produced by Chuck Lorre, but, it, but, it, but it's still like Charlie Sheen in it. No, no. Kathy Bates is the only name I know in it, but she runs a, a, a weed dispensary in California called Ruth's Alternative Care. And it's just 10 episodes and it's, it's totally structured like a sitcom, except each episode has at least one moment of brilliance. A lot of it's stupid, but then there is at least a moment in each one. And it's just kind of cool to see the old sitcom, but with, you know, people saying fuck and Kathy Bates being funny. And I'm just really interested in, I don't know, all the cannabis culture right now, not just because of weed itself, but because it is a changing culture. And that's just, um, a really interesting landscape to observe. You remember when Alf was on Mr. Robot? That's I was just that. thinking that. Yeah. <laughs> Why were ah, you both thinking that? Really? <laughs> sitcoms. Oh, all right. Um, it's like the closest thing to a sitcom I've watched in years. <laughs> well, the laugh track is a funny thing because I just, I mean, Robin and I watch Friends literally every single night it's our like falling asleep show it's just on every night and so i'm so used to laugh tracks and sitcoms and then we watch something like modern family or whatever where you know modern sitcoms don't have the laugh track and it's it's like i know that we had talked a lot about friends when the one with all the writing advice was coming out and i remember some gen y typers who were like um oh, I just can't get past the, the laughing in the background. And it's like, I just never thought that was strange, but it really fucking is. Like, it's really stupid when you think about it. What? I mean, some of the shows were filmed in front of a live audience and didn't have that. Did that feel strange or no? Yeah, it did. It was like, it's telling you when to laugh. I mean, I guess the live studio audience, it's like, I can hear these people laughing, but at least there's a reason for it. But it I, I think it's... it's yeah, it, I think it's a psychological thing. Uh, like when you go to a comedy movie by yourself and there's like nobody in the theater, yeah. it's not nearly as funny as when other people are laughing. That's no, well, that's why, I, that's why it's like I was trying to dissect it just, just looking. Once I noticed it, I was like watching modern sitcoms and going, 
it's weird. There's, it's like there's a lot of faith that goes into that writing that they just trust that everybody's going to find it. Well, more right, but, but look at look at how differently they're shot. So they don't they're, they're, they don't have the five static cameras when you have five static cameras and there's less energy, there's less movement. So you kind of need to fill in the, the space with canned laughter where yeah, see, I find the um, purposely shaky camera thing obnoxious. Like when they started doing that, I'm like, hold the camera steady ass. Like, what are you NYPD blue? <laughs> right. Like NYPD blue was like, God, just stop, get off the ship. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway. So I feel like we have two minutes before our guest comes in. Do you want to talk about the weather or something? Um, yeah, any hurricanes headed your way, Dave? Oh, God. Okay, so I'll, I'll, <laughs> I, have, I have a comment. I was listening back to um, an SPP because I wanted to, to just, I just, needed, I just needed something to do. So I went back and the one that I landed on, I don't remember what it was. <laughs> I go back and- Dave, is that what you do when you're looking? I've never been in that position where I listen to an old SPP because I needed but something. The, but I just listened to it long enough to where we got to the something cools. And I think Dave went first and, and I said, so Dave, do you find it cool that this time we, Sean and I got hit by a hurricane instead of you? And with a little bit of like two weeks of forethought, like, of course that was before we really <laughs> knew what was going on with the big mother of a hurricane that was coming right for Dave with his name on. Yeah, I can't I, I wait to hear it. about you putting up shutters and stuff on Worst Show Ever. Oh, we have a very special Worst Show Ever today, right? Dave, Dave versus the hurricane? I got lots of bitching. Yeah, wow. I think this is one where we're going to have to break it up. I hope you took notes so that we have weeks. And- <laughs> Actually, like- I, have very, I, I have new things that have happened, so the hurricane will probably fade into the background. What do you do, Dave, if there's like three weeks in a row where you don't have a Worst Show Ever? Do you? I, I like the guy in Memento. Like bobbled he- up. These break the out and like for long. I write down the things that I'm pissed about on my arm. And does your skin just start erupting and like boils and stuff? It, it's like a demon in holy water sort of thing. Mm. I, I do. I do feel when I don't have a release. Like I, I need. I need a release. So like I'll, I'll go to my wife for a release. <laughs> Oh, wow. Okay, there, there <laughs> that just happened. You really want to share this right now? An anger release. Like like she she doesn't yes, exactly. what you call it? She doesn't want to hear my bitching, especially if she somehow hey, baby, you want to go to the bedroom? I got an anger release here. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, like I I'm gonna start calling you guys. Like, okay, we can't do a show. I'm just gonna bitch to you. Get on your anger phone. released off of me. <laughs> Don't or I'll get just, it in my eyes. Or I'll just do like a live Facebook feed of me bitching about shit. But it's not nearly as fun with Dave myself. bitches about shit would actually be a very, very good. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I would listen and or watch that shit constantly. Well, we could do that instead of walking, Dave. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Kelly, can you hear us? I see Kelly join us there. We can hear, but we can't hear you. So you're probably muted. The little mic down there. And then we'll say hello. He's got a list of all the publications uh, on the wall. I hear something now. (laughs) You there? I am. Did it work this time? Awesome. Yes. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Yes, Thank you. Uh, Thank you for joining us. Kelly Lytle from uh, Find Away Voices. Good to have you officially on the show. We talked before. Yes. And uh, and then tried to talk before. (laughs) And then tried to talk before and, and, and failed. That was the famous aborted episode that only the live viewers will uh, know anything about. But the third time is the charm. That's, that's how we know this episode is going to be amazing. Exactly. The best one yet, by far. Um, so to begin with, since we, we have, I mean, there was a lot when we talked before where I was just kind of trying to, um, you know, figure, the, figure it out. We were all trying to figure out exactly where you guys fit in and, and what you're yep. similar to and what you're different from. So can you give us the, the, the big picture view? What exactly is Find Away Voices? Yeah, absolutely. So at the highest level, Find Away Voices, we're a new service dedicated specifically to helping authors and publishers um, create high quality audiobooks. And then once those audiobooks are made, we help you sell them literally or essentially everywhere in the world that audiobooks are sold. 
So we have a community of narrators, um, all professional, all vetted, all very high quality um, narrators that we work closely with. Um, and we work with you as the author or you as the publisher as you tell us about your book. And we help create personalized recommendations, uh, casting recommendations from the community of narrators that we're connected with. And then you're able to um, uh, audition those narrators, review those narrators, et cetera. And then we have an entire workflow online that helps manage uh, you through the process. And then once we have the book done, we help you get it. I think we have 30 some odd partners right now uh, covering all business models um, all over the world that help you get you know, your book to as, your audio book to as many listeners as possible. And we do it all with the explicit goal to have you as the author in control the whole way. So there's no exclusivity requirement or ask ever from us. Uh, you control price, the list price that you set, and we pay royalties off that price uh, for as many partners as, as we can at the moment. There's one caveat there. Um, and you always, you have 100% uh, ownership at all times. Um, and really everything we do starts with empowering you as the author, giving you freedom, giving you control, uh, because we know that's what's been so successful, you know, to drive ebooks, to drive print on demand. And now we want to help you do that with audio books. Um, so we think we're on something pretty, pretty special there. So, so compare yourselves to ACX and or um, a, an audiobook publisher, like our friends at Podium are audiobook publishers. Right, exactly. So the, on the publishing side, it's pretty straightforward. So typically the publisher, right, they've uh, purchased rights to create the audio. They've paid in advance. Um, there's an earn out associated with it, um, something like that, whatever it may be. Um, and so then they'll work with you, probably a similar process, right, where they'll, you know, they'll likely recommend a set of narrators based on uh, the specific style or, or, or design of the book. They would typically um, pick them in our experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, or, you know, you can come with them. Um, and then, you know, right, then that publisher is likely to own the rights to the book since they fronted or paid, invested in the book's production uh, to create it. Um, and then at that time, you know, they're looking for, okay, how do I distribute that book into as many areas as possible? Um, and right, they're doing that on your behalf and they'll likely, you know, take the lion's share of the, the royalties and at least until the book earns out and things like that. So we're very different from that in that, you know, you are, you're in the driver's seat the whole way, you're the owner, so you're coming to us directly, um, you're the publisher, it's a pay for production deal, so you're working, uh, you're choosing the narrators from the group that we've sort of curated and recommended to you, and of course you can always ask for more recommendations or, or whatever you want to do along the way, um, and then you're choosing where you want to sell your book, you're owning more of the royalties in perpetuity, all of those things, and of course, you know, the, the trade-off of that is you're obviously in investing in the book's production um, up front. Um, so that's sort of us, you know, compared to publishers, um, um, which I think is, is pretty straightforward. Um, and then when it comes to ACX, uh, I would say, you know, there's a lot of similarities, but at the same time, there's a lot of uh, very core and foundational differences as well. Uh, so both of us, I think, you know, work uh, specifically or target independent authors, small publishers. Um, so that's the same, you know, with ACX, it is a pure marketplace where they are very hands off. Uh, whereas our team, uh, you know, we have more of a, I'll call it a guided experience, uh, more of a concierge, more of a hands-on type experience where, you know, with ACX, you'll go in and you'll, you know, you might see 40,000 narrators to choose from and you're trying to wonder where to start or where do I begin, you know, with us, you know, we actually want to hear about your book first. And then we want to do a lot of the heavy lifting for you and let our casting team help narrow the scope for you to make that decision easier. Um, you know, and then, you know, when it comes specifically to ACX, um, you know, there's the, I would say the encouragement to choose exclusive distribution from Audible, uh, with Audible, with Amazon, with iBooks. Um, and now while that covers most of where audiobook sales are coming from. At the same time, there's 25, there's 30 other locations that are growing by double figures every month, every year. Um, and that number of core audiobook sellers is growing. So while that may be the sort of core place where listeners are finding your audiobook today, it's certainly not going to be everything where you wanna be in the next six, nine, 12 months. Uh, but they do sort of encourage that exclusivity. Um, they're also looking to set the price based on the um, 
uh, final duration of the book. Um, and again, it's, it's very hands-off. So the relationship is just direct between the author and the narrator. Um, whereas with Find Away Voices, um, you know, everything we do, it's a non-exclusive platform. So you have full choice, full freedom uh, to choose where you want to sell your audiobook, how you want to price it, um, library, retail, K through 12 channels. Um, and then during that experience, we have a team that's dedicated to working with you and your audiobook as it goes through the life cycle. So if you have any questions, um, you can ask us, you can ask your narrator, you can, if you're the narrator, you can ask the author as well. We have all of that, uh, but we just want everyone to know, you know, we're also there as well um, because, you know, this is, can be a, uh, you know, sometimes creating an audiobook can be, um, you know, it can be an interesting adventure and, you know, we stand behind uh, every project and we're there, you know, to offer full support with the, and service for everything. So I'd say those are the core differences. Now you said, <laughs> you said it's an upfront investment um, and, you know, us and the authors are used to that. What, what are the uh, typical costs for creating these uh, books, audio yep. books? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, so first, I, I failed to mention uh, another core difference with us in ACX is a lot of projects on ACX are done on a royalty share basis. Um, everything we do is paid for production. You know, we do that because we want you as the author owning more of the earning more of the royalties and keeping more of the royalties for the lifetime of your book, plain and simple. Um, and so in terms of, of the upfront investment uh, into creating the audiobook. Uh, like any good answer, it depends. Um, and it depends on the, uh, the narrator that you choose, the length of your audiobook. And what we do is we actually, we look at every project and we will recommend, you know, anywhere from five to 10 or so narrators. And we, we cover a range of per finished hour rates. So we cover everything from a hundred, $125 per finished hour through, I think we're just wrapping a few um, audiobooks that were actually in the uh, uh, north of $500 per finished hour. So, you know, we, it's a pretty wide range. Again, we want you to have the ability to listen to multiple voices at multiple price points and sort of make the right decision for you. Um, if I had to create a range for it, you know, right now we're, you know, we, you know, there's no real sweet spot, but, you know, around the sort of $200 per finished hour range is, is you know, we see a lot of activity, but we also have tons of activity above that point and then also, um, you know, below it as well. So it's really sort of just across the board. We've been uh, amazed since we, we officially launched at the number of projects, you know, all throughout that, that spectrum. Do you feel like, um, <laughs> what is that noise? <laughs> do we have goblins? <laughs> do you, uh, do you, what is the big, uh, price difference, like from a $200 narrator to a 500? Is it just the level, the quality of their voice, the level of their experience, their track record for bringing readers to their book? Exactly. So before you answer that, Kelly, I'm actually curious. I don't know if you can do this because, uh, you know, you don't want to put people's names to it or anything like that, but we've had some stuff professionally done by Podium with some of the same narrators, Absolutely. Um, you know, like Gone Girl and stuff. And then we've had people that we've hired off of ACX. And I'm just curious, as you were answering Sean's question, if we can get a feel for what $200 gets you on maybe on that spectrum versus five. Yeah, I can, I can say this, it, you know, again, um, to answer the, the, the first part, the, you know, it's all of the things that you mentioned. So, you know, price will depend on experience. A uh, number of audiobooks. Um, you know, narr uh, every narrator with Find Away Voices is completely free to set their own rate. So we don't dictate or we don't influence that at all. So we let them, um, you know, experience the site and see what you know what may or may not work. Um, so you know, all of those factors contribute to you know where they price themselves um, and where you know where they think you know the the sort of right spot is. Um, for what they do um, in terms of, you know, there's, there's no question. Um, you know, I, I can say this, honestly, there's, we have, um, there's a series we have, I'll use sort of one series to prove uh, maybe, maybe the whole, uh, we have a series going right now for, I want to say it's 175 per finished hour and it is immaculate. Like it is absolutely 100% just an amazing audio performance uh, that is just blowing me away every time, a, a, you know, we get to, we get to hear a snippet. Um, so I can say, you know, unequivocally, unequivocally um, the quality 
that we have at all of those price points um, is significant. And sure, you know, between any one narrator, there can be some differences between, you know, based on the the sort of, um, you know, maybe fullness of the voice or the richness of the voice. But I wouldn't say that it actually is based on the price. I would say it's more just the nuance between the different narrators themselves. Um, because again, we're, you know, uh, uh, sort of validating, you know, everybody on the platform and ensuring that, you know, no matter where you are, um, you're able to, uh, you know, commit and to perform a really high quality finished audio book that you as the author um, are going to love and you're going to be proud to share with your listeners. So, um, you know, to us, you know, we want to let you guys, you know, you as the authors decide what sounds right for your work and what works best is the cost. And I can assure you, you know, across that price point, we're seeing fantastic audio books get made the whole time through. Um, I, I talked before that um, I'm hearing an echo. I hear a goblin. Yeah, that's a good goblin. I don't know who that is, but I'm hearing myself. Anyway, um, when we talked before, I remember the, the comparison in, in my mind, you can tell me whether this is right or not, was when I, before when I asked about traditional audiobook publishers and ACX, was I was comparing you guys much more closely to ACX with obviously some key differences, as you mentioned, and right. we'll talk more about. But it's, it's, a, it's a, an, a publisher publishes your book, you are another venue for publishing a book like ACX gets you onto the same platforms and all that stuff. So my question um, is what, trying to think, because I, before when we, I feel like I apologize to everybody because this is before we talked and I'm, I'm referring to that, but I remember coming into it like, what's the catch, right? Like ACX, right. it feels like controls all the cards. Like that's the way you get into Audible. You right. can do iTunes and stuff, but you take this exactly. like, hot. So what's, what is the catch? How are, you, how are you able to do that and be like another ACX role? Yeah, I, look, I think, uh, you know, hopefully there is no catch. Uh, you know, we try to be, you know, as upfront as possible. Um, but, you know, the biggest thing for us, you know, I think that, that is different is, again, you know, our projects being paid for production. So as a result, you know, you as you as the author are willing to invest in that in your audiobook um, being pub, being produced and being published, um, and so that's the first step. And then if you're willing to do that, and again, you know, we 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 hope to make that as um, let's call that manageable or as a, you know cost effective as possible to help drive your ROI um, on the recommendation side. You know, if you're willing to commit to that, then you know we want to give you or we can then give you. Audible, Amazon, iBooks, um, Kobo, um, you know, many others, this whole distribution spectrum, uh, distribution offering uh, such that, you know, not only do you have that audiobook, but now you can sell it, you know, really wherever audiobooks are sold. So there's no real catch to it other than, you know, that first commitment to say, hey, I do want to make an audiobook, or I do at least want to uh, hear narrators. I want to audition narrators and see what it's like. And then, you know, once you make that commitment, um, you know, we think we, we offer a fantastic service to help get that book out wow. to as many places as we can. Do you have any kind of guidance for, um, for authors who maybe they want to make sure that they're doing this? <clears throat> But it, it is a big investment. Audio is much more of a gamble than, um, it, it's never anything, well, at least, I, like I wouldn't suggest you do it in phase one. You're building your author platform, um, right. going all out on audio, yes. like, like a difficult especially thing. Especially pay for production. Right, right, especially pay for production. So um, do yep. you, would, would you guide a new author to um, wait until they could afford audio, like take the profits from print and, and go in audio or do you say, well, these genres are, you know, tend to be more successful. So I'm a newbie author and I'm looking into audio. I'm really interested. I understand that it is a, an emerging market that's growing quickly and I want to be a part, but I only have one series out, three books, and I'm not making very much money. Do, should I do audio? Mm -hmm. That's a good, that's a great question. Um, and I think that, um, um, you know, the answer to that, um, yes, of course, I think you should always uh, make audio, especially as uh, the market continues to grow um, and the opportunities to sell your book also continue to grow. Um, but with that being said, you know, you as the author also should be realistic with the invest upfront investment that you'll need to bank and then what, you know, the expectation, you know, for sales can be. So if you only have those three books and you have you know, just this one series uh, perhaps it's not the right time yet just because you don't have 
that inherent audience that's ready, you know, to make the step, not just to purchase the ebook or the POD, but also to then get the audio book. Um, and so maybe it's just not the right time quite yet. But with that being said, there's certainly things that you can do. And I think our platform allows for that, um, that perhaps let you test and experiment that. So you can always, you know, you can always experiment with that first book and give it a shot. But the other thing you can do that I think could be very interesting and very compelling is, you know, perhaps you write or you have uh, a series of shorter of short stories or novellas or something that's a little bit more, uh, could be a little bit more cost effective in audio. Um, so you create those first as a way to get into audio or as a way to establish relationships with narrators, um, as a way to understand, you know, maybe a little bit different of the uh, dynamics um, in terms of marketing for audio and, 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 and how you can promote your book. Um, but you do so at a price point that perhaps is a little bit more manageable and you're, you know, you're more confident in your ability to earn that back um, or that it's a smart investment. And then because of our distribution platform, right, it's not all tucked away behind a credit subscription. You know, we have unlimited subscription partners where, um, you know, subscribers on those platforms pay a flat fee per month and they're able to consume as many, um, you know, as much content as they choose to that month. So it's, you're actually able, you know, you could be able to get uh, a little bit different style of book out that way uh, because of that distribution network where you're able to perhaps experiment in audio, perhaps test and get a sense for, okay, this is what's working with audio when I do it on this, you know, with this style of book. Okay, let me see if I can now apply it as I've built my audience on my, you know, my longer series. So I think there's a lot of different things that you can do there. Um, I think, you know, making, you know, like anything, um, especially with the series, you know, you want, you want your audience to grow with the voice of that series, the same way that they're growing um, and sort of living with the book itself as it goes from book one to, you know, book six, nine, 12, whatever it may be, you know, you want them doing very much the same um, with the audio performance. So, you know, in, in, in my mind, you know, yes, I, I love the idea of testing and experimenting and creating that first audio book, but I really like the idea, you know, if, if you have, if you're able to, you know, to go with all, you know, the full series, I think that gives you a better chance holistically to earn everything, um, you know, to really drive success because you have that, you know, that full product. But generally, shorter stuff doesn't do as well, right? And I know we can set our own prices here, so that, that does mm -hmm. help. But you are competing against the people who they just want long stuff because they have their two credits per month. Or well, and that's what I was going to ask us yeah. about credits and stuff. So, yeah. I mean, generally, the rule of thumb we've heard is on Audible. It's um, longer works. We, 10 hours is sort of the rule of thumb that we've been using because it's a credit yeah. system, and if you get two per month, you use them on 10 hour books and you use them on short stories, but does anything change with you guys with credits and, and, or any of the subscription services or anything like that? In yeah. Terms so, of so, oh, sorry. So yeah. So specifically, um, you know, historically with audiobooks, right, you have to be credit worthy, uh, kind of in quotes, um, where you need to be at that 10 hour mark. So, you know, your pricing will warrant interest from the credit subscribers. Um, one of the differences with the breadth of our distribution, excuse me, is that you have, um, we have several uh, partners who offer an unlimited subscription offering to their consumers. So that's TuneIn and Scribd and Playster um, to, to name uh, some pretty large ones and growing ones. Um, and what you can do there, you know, there is no credit. There is no, you know, cap at one book or two books a month. Um, once a uh, subscriber has paid $8.99 a month, they're able to listen to as much content as they want. So if you have a shorter series that's, you know, five books that essentially make up that, you know, 10 hours, you know, you could, you could add them individually um, as their own two hour works or whatever it may be and drive listeners to that platform um, where, you know, again, they're only paying that one time up front and then they're able to move uh, sequentially through that series. So that's where we see some shorter form content uh, versus the, the, you know, the full audio book being, uh, you know, more audience friendly. Um, because again, if you're on, the, if you're only available uh, at Audible or in the credit-based subscription world, of course, yeah, you're, you know, you're sort of subject to being long enough to, you know, to be over that price point and be deemed credit worthy. But with these other platforms, you certainly have an opportunity where users are more, um, I think, open to uh, just trying shorter content and different content because there's no, you know, sort of secondary cost to them after that monthly subscription. <laughs> do you know what percentage of the, sorry, sorry. Do you know what percentage of the market is on um, Audible 
and iTunes versus the other little niche players? Oh, in terms of uh, audio audiobooks themselves? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Audible has, you know, I would say Audible has um, most every, you know, unless something is very exclusive to a particular platform, chances are Audible and, and Amazon uh, will be selling it. Um, but with that being said, you know, these the subscription platforms offer, you know, huge catalogs as well, hundreds of thousands of, of And of do you know what, like the, what the payout is? Is it based on, like, like in select, it's based on a page length, right? You get per read, right. so is it per minute, right. or how do, how do you get paid out on these smaller players? Yeah. So, so to you as, you as the publisher on the, um, uh, just speaking generally for, you know, there's different, there's different flavors, you know, but the um, sort of largest of the unlimited subscription models is it's, it, to you as the author or the rights owner, it feels like a, a, a retail transaction. So every time, basically what happens is every time a listener consumes past a certain percentage of the book, it triggers a transaction on the back end and you're paid um, whatever, you're paid based on the list price that you've set for that book on that platform uh, times the, you know, whatever the royalty rate is for that, for that partner. So um, there's no waiting or there's no, you know, sort of, you know, listening, waiting or anything like that. It's it, to you, it feels like a transaction, but to the consumer, it's all an unlimited subscription. So it actually works really well. Got it. Um, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> we actually didn't even um, cover that unless I'm really missing. And it's kind of important. So um, commission on audible is that you, that you pay as well. Uh, so we are the uh, non-exclusive rate um, that's offered uh, via Audible. So it's 25% of the sales price that they set. Okay. And what and about the other whole, What's that? What, what about the other players? Yep. So then it varies between, um, depending on uh, channel and model, um, it varies. So we range anywhere from uh, 40 to 45% for our a la carte partners. Uh, so just pure retail transaction or, or li traditional library transaction. Um, and then our, uh, so that's 40% to 45% of the list price that you set. So for all of our partners, other than, you know, the audible ecosystem, you as the author are paid off the list price that you set. They're the only ones who dictate, you know, payment off the sale price. Um, so again, subscription, or sorry. So, a la carte retail is 40 to 45% of list. Uh, subscription is anywhere from 30 to 40% of list price. Um, and then we have some other, um, I'll call them pool style subscription mechanics that's all based on, weighted on uh, the percent of listening um, that your title may have, may have consumed. Um, and then prior to um, uh, publishing the title and as you review, as any author reviews, inside the Find Away Voices system, we have a full rate sheet that shares all of our partners, their royalty rates, um, and what their business model is, plus a description, so you can see that uh, very clearly. Is it a little like um, in KDP Select, though, where, um, I'm sorry, there's just an echo every time I talk. Am I the only one hearing that, you guys? No, okay, so so if you're in, if you're in Select, then, um, the, it's a little like the royalty is different. It's not, but um, because you have so much more exposure, it's just they have all the market share. So the parallel here is if you're an Audible, but you're getting that non-exclusive rate, is it more expensive to be everywhere for a lot right. of authors? Yep. And so I think that's the big question. And that's where, um, you know, use, you know, it's, it's, we certainly, you know, we value non-exclusive distribution. Um, we think that is, the way to go. So we certainly recommend that. Um, but uh, that is a big question for you as the author, right? If, you know, if I am evaluating exclusive versus non-exclusive, um, can I make up that 15% difference versus the um, audible exclusivity or the, um, um, you know, the non-exclusive rate? And so, you know, that's a big question. Now, in our eyes, especially with where audiobooks are going and where that market for audiobooks is going, you know, I think over the next, you know, nine, 12 months or six to nine months, um, where you're going to see several large, I think, retail and subscription partners uh, spring up who have huge audiences and huge followings, um, plus the opportunity to run uh, more price promotions, more price discounts, uh, more marketing um, activity. Uh, will be at your control because again, you're able to control price and you're able to, to, to do some of that. Um, I think, you know, the opportunity to make up for that is going to be significantly 
uh, more real, you know, than it was, you know, even yesterday. And especially just because, look, audiobooks grew 40 plus percent uh, last year, and they're going to do it again this year, and that trend is continuing. So we certainly, uh, you know, we see that happening um, and continuing to, to to play out that way. So we think it's definitely something, um, you know, that that is worthwhile, and we think it's worthwhile now. And I can certainly say it's going to be worthwhile in the next, you know, by this time next year. I think the audiobook market for, especially for independent authors, with what they can access and how they can market their books, is going to be uh, so much more advantageous. I, I think actually, you want to go ahead, Dave. Oh, you, you mentioned marketing opportunities. Uh, what what are the marketing opportunities? How how can you help an author uh, marketing on all these different services? What kind of pull do you guys have, like with Audible? <laughs> and the other company? Right. Yeah. You know, it's always you're always fighting for for more, right? Um, uh, but we work very closely um, with all of our partners, um, and with many of them, we have direct relationships where. Um, you know, because of um, uh, relationships from another side of the find a way business, we actually, um, you know, in some cases provide um, actual title marketing, actual title merchandising recommendations direct to their teams. So we're constantly feeding them, you know, the, here's the new titles, you know, from find a way voices that you need, you know, need to uh, be on the lookout for. Um, here's some of the, you know, the features we want to have this month and continuously recommending them. Uh, we'll work with our authors. If there's a, um, if there's a uh, promotion that you're interested in running, if you're looking to discount your prices, you know, for some of your titles or part of a series. So we'll work with you there. Um, we have some, um, you know, of course, just the, the fact that you can control and change pricing is another advantage. Um, you know, we'll be adding additional technology to help, um, help you share your book to all of your, um, uh, to all of your retail or to all of your audience, uh, with all of your retailers that are available. Um, and so, you know, we're continuously sort of expanding what we can offer there, but that's sort of the, the nice starting point we're at now as well as some coupon yeah. codes, discount codes from Audible and some other partners as well that you can share. Yeah, my, my worry here, and like I'm, I'm really, I, I keep approaching this from the perspective of like a brand new author or somebody who just right. has a small catalog um, coming out because I, I think there's, there's I, I, I think this is a great thing if you can truly afford to do it and you can step in. But even for us, like we've invested a lot in our fiction and right to figure out like how how do we enter this marketplace because this is a big gamble for us and right. you know if we're looking at what genres sell the best what would be the right gamble and even some of the suggestions like well you could experiment with a shorter work but the math to me like i'm, I'm trying to understand the math because that's not really adding up to me because if we go to experiment with let's say a shorter piece that's just two hours like that's a great experiment but it's right. still like let's say it's $500 by the time we're all done with it, plus our time sure. to figure out and put it there. And then, so we get right. it out, it's $500. I cannot imagine how long it's gonna take to ROI on that because we can't charge very much. And the only places that we are, if we're non-exclusive with Audible, and no one's gonna buy that short thing on Audible, but you said that it's just non-Audible is a tiny percentage of the market. So where does the ROI on that $500 come from? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, look, it, you know, so much of it is driven by, obviously, by your audience. Um, you know, I can use the example of one book that we published. Um, we published it in the end, toward the end of July. Um, done, you know, the cost of it was, let's say, about $1,000. Um, and, you know, the sales have been uh, pretty evenly distributed from Audible through the rest of the partner base. Um, and that book took about 45 days to, um, uh, so just very recently broke, uh, broke even. Uh, um, so, you know, it's already earned back the full investment. Um, so the opportunities are certainly there, but it does come back to, you know, do you have that existing audience, right? Um, because that's, that's very helpful. Um, it was, a, it's a, it's a romance book. We see, you know, that's a, that's a huge genre, um, that continues, you know, to sell very well. Um, and, um, um, and it's part of, um, you know, a series that, uh, you know, had some traction on the ebook and other sides. So you know, I think those factors went into it very well um, in terms of, you know, me being able to, you know, sell you as the new author and say, hey, exactly. Like if you invest $500, I can promise you, you know, you're going to sell 200 books in two months. Um, you know, we don't have that data quite yet. 
Um, and so, you know, it's still, you know, we're sort of evolving it. I don't have that, you know, great answer for you other than to say, you know, it's like any other decision where you're weighing, you know, your audience with the value of the distribution network, um, you know, the narrator's reach and their voice, um, and then plus the, you know, the worthiness of the investment while all around you, the audiobook market is growing another 40%. Um, you're seeing, you know, massive inflows of new listeners driven by, you know, these new partners and whether you can tap into that and, you know, leverage our system to do so is sort of the, you know, the question and, and you know, we're working as hard as we can to, you know, continue to help authors answer that. Well, I think we're always really excited about, I think we're always really excited about any new tool that, that is going to help authors kind of grab the next rung, right? We're always talking about leveling up. So level up your quality, level up your package excuse me, level up the different mediums that you're in. Like that's all a really good thing. And I think that for the right offer or author, this is a great offer because you do help them curate. And that's a huge roadblock with ACX. We totally right. fell on our face with a ACX because <laughs> we didn't know anything about casting. But right, the, right, right, right. What, what, I, what I'm trying to, what I'm trying to navigate here is I feel like we're dangerously giving the wrong advice to the wrong authors. And like, I want to be careful there because we do need to encourage authors to spend money on themselves and their business. Right. We, we do that consistently, but yes. like, I, I mean, that's, that's a, that's a pretty straight question. What advice do you give to the new author? And like, I don't want to hear, let's record something short and invest that because that's, that's the wrong thing for most author, authors from where I'm coming from. So let's figure out who the, ideal, who the ideal author to listen to this offer right now is so we can make sure that the right authors get in your funnel and the wrong authors save their money. So we're talking, I think we're talking about authors who have a successful catalog and are making enough to where they can say, they can choose audio the next place to invest, okay, now I already know I've sold X number of units in ebook. Now I'm going to scale up to do this other thing. Would you say that sounds about right? Yeah, there's no question that right now that's, you know, core audience right there. Those authors, you know, you have a following, you've had success on the ebook side, you have that audience, um, you have the royalties to roll into audiobook production, and you have the confidence based on your fan base, your following, that you'll be able to drive those sales. There's no question about that. Um, and so I think that is, you know, smack dab, like right where we are, an incredible value proposition. So no question about that. I think on the new author side, you know, the best recommendation I can give, and it, you know, might fly counter to, you know, the sort of sales, you know, side of the sales story is, um, keep your finger, you know, stay in touch with us, keep your finger on the pulse of where audiobooks are going, because what I think we're likely to see is, again, the market continue to grow, the number of large uh, sellers of digital content who are focused on audiobooks and have dedicated audiobook offerings uh, continue to increase. Um, the ability to, through pro promo sites, whether it's um, Audioboom or you know, BookBub down the road, hopefully, and others where you're able to um, run the, dis you know, use some of the discovery tools that have been so successful with ebook and discount your audiobook um, on some of these retailers, um, which will help you drive sales and drive awareness, um, you know, in addition to everything else. Um, while those take shape, then I think it says, okay, now I've, I've grown my audience a little bit. I have uh, on the ebook side, you know, I've seen these, um, some of these advances now with audiobooks uh, because with each passing day they increase. Um, now I think I'm ready to, you know, to dip my toes in the water and now let's go, go ahead and do it. Um, so I think that's sort of how I would be thinking about it if I were um, a new author trying to get accustomed to, uh, or, you know, trying to, trying to start thinking about creating audio. Um, what, I mean, as Sean mentioned with the, with narrators and casting, that was really tricky for us. Um, what would you, what have you learned and what would you, like what sorts of things do you tell people about, um, you know, how to find the right narrator, that sort of thing? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we have a, we have a dedicated casting team that reviews, you know, every list that we send out and we do our best to, um, you know, to take that expertise um, and to uh, articulate it through the recommendations that we have. Um, you know, in terms of, of advice, um, you know, there's a couple of things. One, um, the narrator voice that you have in your head may not be, you know, what you actually um, hear, because sometimes, you know, that might not be the right interpretation of the book. And so I would always say approach it with a very open mind um, as you listen to 
um, uh, the uh, whether it be an audition or a recommendation. Uh, number yeah, two, I, I, have, I, have, I, have, I have a romance idea, and I'm thinking Gilbert Godfrey for the voice. <laughs> Trust me, you should see. Uh, we've we've had requests for you know alien alien voices, um, <laughs> you know wizard voices, wizard voices that can do an alien voice. Um, you know, you know, sometimes you get, it, it's, it is every, it runs the gambit of everything in between, um, which is just incredible. But, um, you know, so I'd say, you know, be open to the suggestions because, you know, we, we have a team here that's dedicated and we're very focused on it and, and we take great pride in it. Uh, the second is that, you know, if you have feedback and it's, and it's constructive feedback, um, you know, with just a couple of pieces of information, a couple of bullet points about what may be in your head doesn't have to be eight pages of production notes. It can just be a couple of things around pacing or tone or, or tempo. You know, the narr narrators are so talented as voice actors that they're able to take that little nugget and interpret it into, you know, a truly fantastic performance. So they can, you know, just that little bit can really elevate the performance. So I'd say, you know, have, you know, the, a t you know, a two or three bullet point list of just key points that you want to convey. Um, and, you know, that goes a long way. And then I think, you know, uh, the third being, um, um, you know, trust, again, trust in, you know, the process, because, you know, we're not, um, you know, again, we're not going to turn you loose with 40,000 plus narrators. We want to give you 10 that we think will be great. Yeah, I think, yeah actually, I think that's the key. I, I think that's the key right there is, is, uh, uh, is the framing on this, that mm -hmm. we really strongly believe in collaboration, obviously. Right. right. And I would look at this as a collaboration service where you're looking like the, the curation is what I'm really hearing is the sweet spot. So. Right. It's it's almost like um, it, like having a personal shopper to get your audio done. Where it, it, it's like it, it is it's a concierge service to help you get that done, and that's fantastic yeah. for the right author. But it's not. I mean, because I, my my worry is discoverability is what a lot of authors are looking for, right? Like for us, that's the most important thing is discoverability. And I, I do see audio as a really powerful discoverability channel because there are a lot of people who live in their cars or right. in a commute and they're never going to pick up a book and read it, but they'll audio all day long. So it is a great way to get in those channels. But, yep. you know, as long as you know what you're buying, how much you're spending and what you expect your return to be, I think that's great. Yeah. And, and we actually do that, you know, as you go through the process um, and we, rep and we uh, recommend narrators or, you know, first you tell us how long your book is and we'll give you an average range of what, um, what the cost, you know, could be based on sort of a standard range of narrator rates when we recommend. Um, and then we also share, you know, based on, you know, sort of ret a return, uh, a return structure and royalties, um, you know, what a sort of break even point could be along the way, just so again, it comes down to transparency. So, you know, we want you to know what you're investing in um, as much as possible ahead of time as you're evaluating each narrator, as you're evaluating the voices and making what, um, you know, we hope is the right decision for you. All right. Sorry. I was, I was muted there. Um, all right. So, so thanks very much for um, coming on the, sh on the show. Kelly, Thank you. Um, what, what else, is there anything else that people uh, need to know? Um, I mean, obviously yeah. they can go to findawayvoices.com, check you guys out, but anything in parting? Yeah, exactly. You know, we're, we're here to help. You know, we are a service we want. We're huge believers in audio. We believe, you know, wholeheartedly in where it is going in the future. And so we're here to help you create fantastic audiobook and then get it to as many listeners as possible. So if you're interested, um, come to findawayvoices.com and check us out. Send us an email. We have a great service team. We're always happy uh, to respond and to help you along the way. And just know that, you know, as you go through this process, if you've never done it before, or if you've done it and you've struggled with that experience, you know, our goal is to make it as easy and as seamless as possible with you having full freedom and control during it. So um, anything we can do to help, just let us know. All right. Thanks so much. All right. And, um, All right. We'll be in touch soon. Thanks, Sounds Kelly. Good. Everybody See for listening to the Self-Publishing Podcast.